So we're doing a great job. We're only two minutes behind today. <laughs> I think we win the uh, we'll win the uh, the award for for this summit um, with this day and panel as far as timekeeping is concerned. Um, Dr. Weber, do you want to introduce introduce Dr. Boland? As he's, as he's making the, his way up, um, the way we go about structuring or kind of putting this program together every year is, you know, we don't just sit in a room isolated, the two of us or the, you know, four of us and dream this up ourselves. We go out to every other organization in the space and all of our faculty members that have been here in previous years and ask them what they, um, you know, from their community are hearing that's really important to, to dig into at the next summit. And um, so this talk is a direct result of, of one of those conversations. I just want to say that was a fantastic uh, session and thank all of you for uh, being here to do that. And also looking out, uh, you know, we were a little unsure what the participation would be on the second morning. And uh, we're immensely uh, gratified to see that there are a lot of people here. So we really, really appreciate that. And that inspires us to think of a larger platform for next year, but let's not go there now. So some of you will know that Professor Boland is really, um, he's not gonna be happy with me, but I have to be honest. He is a legendary figure in uh, researching uh, hereditary colorectal cancer. And I don't want to take away any of his thunder. He's probably going to share with you a little bit of his family history. I'll just say it's significant. Um, I will also underscore what Cindy said is, you know, these sessions today are really driven by our survivor community focus groups. We actually take the time during the year that we're pulling our hair out trying to organize the program to sit down and listen to our survivor community. And, you know, some people couldn't believe it, but I said, well, you know, they want a, they want a world-class talk on epigenomics. So we're gonna get one. Dr. Boland, thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna change gears a little bit right now. Um, let me give you a little historical perspective about where I come from. So I got interested in colon cancer when I was a medical student because of my family history. And just to let you know for all the survivors out there, probably nobody in this room's had more colonoscopies than I have. So I understand your pain uh, in that regard. So when I was a medical student, um, I recognized something was going on in my family. And that got me interested in trying to figure out what was going on. So my focus through my career has been to try to figure out what, where cancers come from. And, uh, what inspired me was the fact that once we figured out where Lynch syndrome came from, we, we could tell which people in the disease or in, a, in the family were at risk, which ones weren't. We knew what to do, and people can live a long time uh, with that uh, being cancer-free now. And so, and serendipitously, we now have spectacular therapy for, uh, for the advanced disease. So I'm hoping we can do the same thing with this early onset disease. <clears throat> so the question is, what is, what's the cause of early onset colon cancer? Is it just the, the end of the, of the curve? Are there some unique causes? As we heard yesterday from, uh, from Matt Jorglin, from uh, Elena Stoffel, from um, Heather Hampel, less than 20% can be tra traced to strong genetic heritable factors. And the initial thought that I had as, as my research career went through the Lynch syndrome thing, and I, I began to think, well, how about all of these other young people who have colon cancer who don't have Lynch syndrome? What is it? Um, and, and we now know what it isn't, really. Um, and, but there are some epidemiological clues you heard about, like the rising incidence of the early onset disease, the more distal location, and possibly more virulent forms. Suggest that maybe there's something special going on there. So what would be the possible hypothetical causes. The known hereditary colon cancer syndrome, we know about that. That's only a small portion. DMMR, that's defective mismatch repair activity, which would be a hint that you're dealing with Lynch syndrome. That occurs in under 20% you know, or so. About half of those are Lynch syndrome. There's something else called Lynch-like syndrome. 
Um, and, uh, and also, some of these cancers have, they have microsatellite and chromosomal stability, max. That's been reported by a couple of groups. I think I have a hint as to what that might be. And there have been proposed changes in the environment, but there's been a lot of those. So the question is, how would it work? And can we work our way backwards from the tumors and the normal tissue uh, to find out what it is? And it's not inflammatory bowel disease. OK, so Dr. Weber asked me to talk to you about epigenetics. Um, so hold on to your handlebars. It's not a big deal. Epigenetics isn't everything beyond gene genetics. It's a very specific thing. It's heritable changes in gene expression without a change in the DNA sequence. And most of the time, it's methylation of DNA. So we've got four bases, ACTG, but the, the, the Cs, the cytosines, can get methylated. So we kind of have five bases in the DNA alphabet. Uh, and what that does is it changes the way the DNA compacts. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's heritably stable as well. So that the offspring, so once a, once a cytosine is methylated in a cell, all the daughter cells stay, uh, stay that same way. And this is a major way that the cell uh, regulates gene expression. So one way to not have a gene express it, like the, the colon doesn't need to make albumin or crystalline uh, lens protein or whatever. So you could either never turn on the transcri transcriptions factors, or you could find a way to turn it off. And, and methylation turns it off. And the, then the turning off takes place um, at the CG. They're called CPGs. Um, that's where a C is next to a G, and the C gets methylated. Now, they've been, they sh that should make up about a pr fairly substantial portion of the genome, but they've been edited out and only make up about 1% or 2% of the genome. There's about, 40, uh, about 45,000 sites, and they're mostly in the promoters of genes, so the promoters, the on-off switch. So you methylate, and you, and you turn it off permanently. And they're, they're not randomly distributed. They're in the promoters. And so when it's highly methylated, the DNA gets compacted, and the transcription factors can't get in there. Uh, so it's a way of turning off uh, transcription factors and enhancers. And it's, just, it's a normal regulatory mechanism in the cell. It just can go wrong at times with, with hypomethylation or hypermethylation. Now, the next thing that we need to keep in mind is there's a certain group of DNA sequences that undergo abnormal methylation in early onset colon cancer. We've got a lot of repetitive sequences in our genome, like 45% of the genome are these tandem repeats. And one of them is called a long interspersed nuclear element. It's a, a retroviral attack that occurred during our evolution, and it encodes for a gene that we don't want to have expressed. It's a retrotransposon. It makes up 17% of our genome. The, the, the genes are all, the, the, those genes are all mixed up. They're, they're mutated and all the rest of that. So they're usually not expressed, but some of them are. There are other repetitive sequences as well. Um, and then there are these shorter sequences, satellites, mini satellites, and microsatellites. That's like microsatellite instability. They're in there too. There are these long non-coding RNAs. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and RNA is expressed at a low level for many of these repetitive sequences. But I think the bottom line is it's a mess in there. I mean, the, 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 our DNA looks like, like the worst uh, hoarder's closet. There's all sorts of stuff from our evolution. And so it's, it's all nailed to the floor, basically. Um, so anyways, promoter methylation silences many of these DNA sequences. So it's a normal thing that happens. <clears throat> so what happens in colon cancers, where there are two varieties of abnormal methylation. One of them is the CPG island methylator phenotype, or called SIMP, where there's too much methylation. And what's interesting is you can get a cancer without a single mutation or a single chromosomal uh, rearrangement if you just silence enough tumor suppressor genes. And that does sometimes happen. But what, what's interesting is this occurs in older patients, so this kind of stuff occurs mainly in older patients. It's a slowly progressive, probably a response to chronic inflammation. 90% of these tumors that have this are in the proximal colon, more in women than in men. Um, and, uh, and, and during this, if one of these DNA mismatch repair genes called MLH1 undergoes biallelic methylation, then you get microsatellite instability, which is what confused us for a long time. 
So you can get microsatellite instability through that mechanism right there or through Lynch syndrome. But these are older, the Lynch syndromes are younger. But if you see that, the, the, the microsatellite instability is not that much different between younger and older people. But in older people, it's SIMP. And in younger people, it's Lynch. Not always, but that's the way it tends to go. Then there's this hypomethylation, global hypomethylation at line one sequences. That's the way you measure it because there's so many of those. It's actually one of the first DNA abnormalities that was found by, by Feinberg and Vogelstein a long time ago. And it's associated with more aggressive tumors and poorer clinical outcomes. So we started looking for, when we had done what we could do in the terms of the genetics, we began to look at the epigenetics of early onset colorectal cancer. The initial hypothesis was maybe that there, this was hypermethylation, like the older people, or maybe there are familial clusters of that. So we got a, a group of early onset colon cancers, late onset colon cancers, and Lynch syndrome, and we looked for methylation, and we first looked for SIMP, and it wasn't there. So then we looked for line one hypomethylation. Um, and what happens is when this hypometh we did find line one hypomethylation, and that nasty gene was expressed again, and it, ex it encodes an RNA polymerase, <clears throat> um, and that's a bad thing, because it, and, the, and the cell knows that, and it works pretty hard to keep those, those sequences silenced. So here's the data that we have. This is really the only data slide. And this is the level of methylation, and this is normal colon, and so, the line one sequences are ordinarily silenced by this level of methylation. And then we had two cohorts of early onset colon cancers, and it was lower. And these are the later onsets and the Lynch syndrome group. I tried to put a line here to show you. See, this is going to be messy. Whatever is going on, it's going to be only going on in a certain subset of these. And we're going to have to tease it apart a little bit. We've got to throw out the Lynch syndromes and throw out the other hereditary ones and then focus on this and then see what's going on down here. And, and here's, the, here's the problem, too. The outcomes, the, these, this is the survivorship among people who didn't have line one meth, hypomethylation, and this is if they did. So this is probably one of the reasons why the outcomes tend to be worse in early onset colon cancer, because it's got this line one hypomethylation going on. Well, what is that? And, and this is, these are all the studies that have looked at line one hypomethylation in a bunch of cancers, and it's always unfavorable. This, there's a recent review that I just tumbled across where someone pulled all this together. And, and one of the consequences is that when you start to express this line one sequence, it hops around and makes for rearrangement. And I'll tell you something at the end about how this can scramble our genome. Uh, we can do that in the laboratory. There's, there's lower degrees of line one methylation in liver metastases in the primary, so it seems to be on an ongoing problem as the, as the tumor progresses. And here's the big thing. Embedded inside these line one sequences are a series of oncogenes. And they're tumor drivers. And as we hypomethylate line one, we re-express these three oncogenes. And we published in this paper that we can find these oncogenes at the RNA level and at the protein level. So they're really being expressed. And we don't probably have readily available good drugs against these oncogenes. Um, all of them are expressed there. So this adds to the virulence of these tumors because of this hypomethylation. So how is methylation ordinarily maintained? Well, there are DNA methyl transferases. They put those methyl groups onto the cytosines. Uh, and it, and, and as, this, as the DNA is replicating, this this enzyme can recognize the, the methylation on one daughter strand and then copy it on the other. And that's how it's heritably, uh, it's, that's how it's inherited to all the progeny cells. So it's stable so that what's methylated in an, in an early colon cancer or an early colonic epithelial cell, it stays that way uh, for a long time. That said, you can get de novo methylation, because ordinarily that the cell has to at times. The embryo erases all the methylation, and so all of these methylation events occur after that. But there's de novo methylation that can occur later. And there are methylation erasers, like this TET enzyme. And there's a whole 
literature on this methylation that says that there are epigenetic effects, changes in methylation that occur really early. So what happens is if you've got a cell that's had certain genes silenced, that they're supposed to be silenced, and then they become non-silenced through the hypomethylation, then when the proliferation rate goes up because of APC or whatever, now you might drive that cancer in a different direction. And there are even some pediatric tumors that have hypomethylation as the sole event that we can find in the tumors, but not very many mutations. And if you, if you take cultured cells that are completely diploid, they have two copies of every chromosome, um, and you culture them in, a, uh, in the presence of a drug that will inhibit DNA methylation, in a short period of time, they become hypomethylated and aneuploid. You really don't want aneuploidy. Um, and uh, they, the cells become more uh, carcinogenic. They can clone them more. Um, so what can activate this whole problem? Well, probably uh, mainly environmental and less so genetic factors, but infections such as Helicobacter pylori can lead to hypomethylation. This seems to occur during, or at least changes in methylation. With aging, we get more methylation, but that can be a problem too. Smoking, environmental toxins, diet, methionine and folate deficiency, particularly in animal models, not so much in humans, or mutations in these epigenetic modifier genes or altered expression of these very these stem, stemness uh, genes as well. And hypomethylation occurs over a lot of our genome. Hundreds of kilobases of heterochromatin is common during the transition to cancer. So how can understanding epigenetics help us with this problem of colon cancer and early onset disease? Well, we need to figure out what the abnormalities of, D, of, of DNA methylation are in cancer. And that study that I'm telling you about has not really, that we did, has not been replicated, even though we had two cohorts that we looked at. There, somebody needs to look at this in more detail and parse out the various subgroups and, and take a look at the methylation in, in, in a little more detail. Now, it turns out that folate, so folate is the, is the precursor to the methyl groups. And there's some evidence that folate-supplemented patients are less likely to have line 1 hypomethylated tumors. And there's an inverse relationship between line 1 hypomethylation and, and alcohol intake as well. Um, but in one other study, and this is a little confusing right now, line 1 hypomethylation was not influenced by folate supplementation. That was a prospective study. So a big question is, can we impact or modify early onset uh, colorectal cancer by dietary intervention? I don't know the answer, but you, we might think of it in terms of what's happening with this uh, epigenetic problem. And I'm going to suggest that global hypomethylation explains the MAX tumors. That might be a way that you can get a cancer that doesn't have aneuploidy and doesn't have, is not hypermutable. Like I said, you can get a cancer without any mutations just by silencing a gene. A gene, if a gene that's silenced is just as out of commission as one that's mutated. There are right now multiple drugs that can inhibit hypermethylation. Some are being used in the clinic. I don't know of any uh, that can reverse or inhibit hypomethylation, and that's something we need to think about. So I think that the, the future topics that should be looked at in the laboratory is to to, to peel apart this problem of this heterogeneous group of tumors, not think of it as just one kind of tumor, but try to see what's going on inside of there um, and what the discrete, discrete groups are. Separate out, whenever we do studies, we should separate out all the Lynch syndromes and all the other hereditaries and the Lynch-like syndromes because they will only confound the data. Um, and also, keep in mind, whatever impact the Lynch syndrome and the Lynch-like syndromes are in the early onset disease, that would only tend to make the disease less virulent. And so if we take that out, we'll, see the, we'll be able to look, get a better look up close at what this disease is. And I think what we need to find out is what are the unifying characteristics of these tumors that have line 1 hypomethylation? Are they like hypomethylated later onset cancers, or is there something different about them? And I think that the, the way we're going to have to look at that is one of the things, so keep in mind, in in the later onset hypomethyl or hypermethylation, that's all, that's 90% in the proximal colon tends to occur in older people. So well, this is maybe a yin and yang kind of thing. And the microbiome is quite different in the cecum than it is in the rectum. And so the microbiome 
how that creates a unique hyper, or, 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 a, a metabolomic um, uh, milieu, and how that affects the DNA of cells. Those would be the, the, the leading culprits. So I think that we need to do deep sequencing of tumor tissue and of normal rectal tissue in the people who have this compared to the appropriate controls to figure out what's going on. So my object was to finish on time and maybe have some time for questions, too. <laughs> yes? Right. Okay, so Dennis is really asking, how can we tease apart the heterogeneity that, that appears to be in this? And that yesterday, Javier Yor told us about early onset colon cancers with wild type APC. I really like that, because if I want to get rid of APC, um, one way to do that would be to, to hypermethylate both promoters. And we know that that happens. APC promoter does have CPG islands, can be methylated. And you can have simultaneously focal hypermethylation and silencing of certain genes and global hypomethylation. So focal hyper and, and global hypomethylation, turning off tumor suppressor genes, and then unleashing that terrible line one sequence and all the embedded oncogenes, too. And we just don't have the answer to that, but it's a completely tractable problem in 2019. Yes. Rick, that was fantastic. Could you just clarify, and I'm sorry I missed it, what, what percentage do you think of early age onset cases separating out the hereditary syndromes, uh, positive family history, et cetera, what percentage are due to the mechanisms that you just described, which how would we describe that? As a hypomethylation or a line one hypomethylation pathway yeah. <laughs> or a SIMP pathway? Can we give it a specific title and then can we give it a metric? Th that's a really good question. Um, first of all, you know, the, the problem was when we did the assays, we got a big ball <laughs> of, uh, you know, the, the inclusion overlapped, of the hypomethylated tumors overlapped with what happened in, in the later onset cancers too. Um, and so I'm not sure if there's anything different about those cancers, uh, compared the early onset hypomethylated versus the later onset, and I think we can figure that out. But it might just be it's the same process, it's just that there's more of it. And if, what's interesting is that there are something like, if you, the people who do deep sequencing of tumors and just, just sequence everything and then analyze that have come up with something like 20 or 30 mutational signatures. I think it's 30 mutational signatures. You look at it, you analyze the data, you say this is a signature. One of them would be a microsatellite instability signature. One would be a, a, a depurination signature, et cetera. So there may well be a signature. And oh, about half of these signatures have not been attached to any known mechanism. So my, my approach, if I were to be doing this now, would be to get a whole bunch of these, do the deep sequencing, look for a mutational signature, and then tease it apart. Throw out the hereditary ones, and then focus on the one. And, and line one might be coexisting with focal hypermethylation of APC or some other genes, too. Yeah, I don't want to hog the mic, but I, I want to underscore Dennis's question. I think it was a really... Uh, as per usual, insightful question, because you know we could. Uh, can these parameters be assessed in paraffin samples? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because maybe you know, following up on what Dennis was asking about, you know, maybe we could look to see 
you know, what is the prevalence of the specific mechanisms you're mentioning as we look back in time at earlier uh, cases of early age onset that have nothing to do with the hereditary syndromes? So and if, if we find a signature, then you can maybe trace it back to a specific microbial mixture that interacts with something that we're all been thinking about, antibiotic exposure, um, sedentary uh, lifestyle, too much fat in the diet, all those things that we heard about might end up here. So what, what Tom was talking about was exactly what I was going to say as a segue, um, <coughs> ancestral samples uh, of early onset colorectal cancer, I think this is what we're talking about, looking at those sig signals, right? Seeing if there are spikes that are different over time, but then in order for that to have any kind of context, you would have to know about the clinical case, right? You would have to know about the patient. Um, I, I remember doing research at, at a time when I was doing uh, work on metastatic potential, and I had, was working with two different breast cancer cell lines, and I worked with MCF7 and I worked with B2. MCF7 basically destroyed all of my um, tissues of different organ systems that I had laid out, whereas the B2 didn't. And I said, gee, why did this happen? So I went back to where they were isolated from, and the B2 um, tumor from breast was taken from a 50-year-old woman with a lumpectomy with no metastasis, and the MCF7 was taken from a 32-year-old woman with a malignant pleural effusion. And I said, Eureka, this is what happens with metastatic potential for specific types of cell types. And when you look back, that was a 30 or 40-year-old sample, um, which was you know, um, put into perpetuity. Uh, this is what I'm thinking about in terms of trying to figure out what happened. Where was the lesion? Did it take place year 10 years ago? Did it take place 15 years ago? And we're starting to see it now. Um, there has to be some insult or a series of insults, whether it be environmental, whether it be lifestyle, whether it be all these other factors that we talked about, antibiotic use, et cetera, that has changed the milieu. Yeah, and everything I showed you can be done out of paraffin. And for goodness sakes, we, now we know that the DNA of a Neanderthal and a Denisovian can be found, you know, or extracted from a bone. So there, you, you know, there's no limit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there'd have to be different testing done because those other mutations are just, uh, they, they ac accumulate in a sequence and they become drivers. There's about between two and eight driver mutations in every cancer, and RAS is one of them, and you know, there are other specific drivers that we find. All I'm talking about here is a process by which things start to get out of control. Not, that's not a specific gene thing, although those oncogenes getting re-expressed is a pretty nasty consequence of that.